Hey everybody, it's Brianna Hodges and I am super excited to have with us on our Coaching Through Uncertainty podcast, the one and only Dr. Katie Novak. Hey, how's it going? How's it going? Hey, I'm so excited to be here. It's super fun to get to talk to educators, especially in these crazy new normal times, whatever you want to call them. This is like a, a real reset on like, why are we doing this? What are we doing? How are we going to do it? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is, this is not even a, I mean, you, we've got classes that are up and running that are going. And so this is time, like it's game time. It's, it's definitely yeah. to, to jump in here. So with that, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Um, who do you, or, you know, where are you? What do you do? Who do you serve? Some of that stuff for those yeah. people that happen to know who you are. Perfect. So I, my name is Katie Novak. Um, I'm a practicing um, administrator. I'm also an education consultant. Um, I taught full-time for 13 years. Uh, for the past six years, I was the assistant superintendent of schools in a district in outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I've also been doing some educational consulting and writing for about five years now. And starting on July 1st, I actually moved to a different position in the district, which would allow me to balance consulting and being a practitioner a little bit more. And so I am the facilitator of professional learning. So I provide professional ongoing professional development to administrators and coaches and educators in the same district where I have been for the past six. So what's really exciting as a consultant is not only kind of doing the research and doing the, the reading and writing, but actually having like ongoing relationships with colleagues who can like call me on this stuff. Like we've tried this, we're reflecting on this. It's, it's not super effective. And so getting to kind of be a part of a professional learning community has been really powerful in creating suggestions for other people outside of our district to try to move forward. I love that because, and, and one of the things that we talk about so much is that there's no perfect solution, right? And in, in, in you certainly, queen of UDL, um, can definitely talk through. There's not a one specific way to do this. Um, uh, you know, you've taught me so, so much. And my favorite phrase that you use so often is that um, firm goals, flexible means. And mm -hmm. I kind of want to throw that at you and, and, and help us as we are really trying to, to put our minds around what's going on right now with so many different elements, so many people out there as instructional leaders, as instructional coaches, principals, all of these things, we're trying to um, take some really uncertain circumstances and bring that into um, provide a, a stable and engaging learning environment. And that's really tough for us educators who like to have a play. Like we like to have a plan. We like to know the answers. We like to, to really be able to provide some structure around that. Um, and we're seeing a lot of our teachers be really, you know, there's a lot of anxiety coming into this. So how, you know, in professional learning, how are you kind of bringing that together? How are you creating some, um, some, some normalcy out of these, these uncertain and quite abnormal times? Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think that it, the, the, it, it really comes back to grounding ourselves. And what I like to focus on in professional learning is there's like three main things that we need to ground ourselves in. And I think that right now there's so much focus on like, how do we do this remotely, which is like learning all these new tech tools. And there's like a lot of bells and whistles. And by, by no means am I saying that technology is not critically important when we're moving remotely. But I think that the real question comes down to a lot of those PLC questions that the DeFores, you know, came up with forever ago, which is like, what is it that we want all students to know and what do we need them to be able to do? Like, that's the first question. Before we start looking at all of these different tech tools, it's like, make a list of the things that students have to know and what they have to be able to do, like the priority standards. And then the next thing is like, how will I know, given where my kids are at, whether they're at home, whether they're in front of me, whether some of them are at home and some of them are in front of me, but like, how will I know that they know that or if they're able to do that? And so it really comes down to what tools do we have that provide a, a platform to us to see how students are doing? Like, what is my way to communicate with students and to see how students are expressing what they know and what they're able to do? And then the other two questions are like, what are we going to do if they can't do it? And what are we going to do if they can do it really, really well? And there seems to be almost like a lack of challenge for next step. And 
when we kind of drive ourselves through those questions all the time, we realize that we have to be really flexible. And so the first step is like those, those firm goals, like what is it that students have to know? And then given that some are home and some are in front of us and some are balancing jobs or watching other siblings or sharing devices, given all that variability, I love the term that they use for UBD, the UBD framework, understanding by design, where they say, what is acceptable evidence? I love that, right? What is it that students need to know? What do they have to be able to do? And what is kind of the buffet of acceptable evidence? And that's when you start saying, well, you know, I was an English teacher for a really long time. So I would be like, okay, I need to make sure that students can write with descriptive detail, right? That's the goal. Students will write narrative, you know, with, with, you know, descriptive detail among other things. And then it's like, well, how will I know that students can write with descriptive detail? They could write it on, on a piece of paper and take a picture of it. They could upload it to a Google Classroom. They could maybe write it and then read it out loud on a Pear Deck. But like it always comes down to how do I see students' descriptive writing? And then what are the scaffolds and supports that I can provide that would get in the way of things that would prevent it? So, well, some students might not really know what descriptive detail is. So let me make sure that I have resources to learn about descriptive detail. You know, some students might not know how to organize it. Let me make sure I have a graphic organizer. And I think that if we go back to like what we know about instruction, then I will say, I need a tool that will help students to organize their writing remotely, as opposed to that tool looks cool and I want to use it. You know, it's start with the goals. What do you need to meet those goals as opposed to like burying yourself and using 50 different websites. Use two websites well that allow you to do what you need to do as opposed to like the variety of tools that everyone and their mother's talking about. And so like what I say to educators is like, literally sit down for September and be like, these are like four things that I absolutely need all my students to know. And this is what I need to be able to do. And then start designing from there because like we can't do all of these things really well. And so something's got to give, like if we have time for self care, something's got to give. And the thing that's got to give is like trying to use a billion tools that all really do the same thing. I love that. I love that. Right. Because instead of having, you know, former English teacher, former English teacher, you're recovering English teacher, as we like to say that, <laughs> You know, there's not one book that will teach every single component of, of the, the of literature. Instead, you know, there's so many different, you can pull them in all these different ways and you can really tweak that. And, and I, I love that mindset of, you know, creating some, um, some lists and then finding those connections in there, narrowing it down, creating personalization, not by creating a different situation for everybody, but instead by creating some of those subsets and then, you know, kind of getting some ideas that go into that. So thank you, thank you, thank you for, for wrapping our brains and, and arms around that. That said, a couple, couple more questions for you. Um, first one is given these uncertain times, um, how, how do you recommend staying so focused in when it seems like that the goal is continually changing sometimes, you know, right? Like it's like, oh, we're going to do this remotely or, oh no, now we're going to do a hybrid or, um, it's going to switch back and forth or whatever the circumstances is. How, you know, what, what suggestions do you have for us in still finding that, you know, that grounding in, in a little bit of certainty? So I don't think the goals ever change. I think the format changes. And I think that that's what we have to remember is like high quality instruction of like, well, I need to, I'm going to go back to descriptive writing. I need students to know what descriptive writing is. You know, let's say, okay, this site has like a really good explanation of it. I'm still going to provide direct instruction. It might be that I have to report it and that I have to send the video. Um, and I might have to send that in a multiple means. So maybe it's in the Google Classroom. I also send it to the local access cable station and they can play it. I might also have to send it through something like a class tag or a remind so everybody gets it on their phone. But like the act of me providing instruction on descriptive, on descriptive writing does not, does not change. Like I'm still gonna always have time for students to reflect on what they already know. I always wanna make sure that they understand what the goal is. You know, your writing and your speech will be wicked boring and no one will know what you're talking about and they won't be able to visualize it if you don't start using descriptive details. 
And then students need opportunities to explore that more. And, you know, maybe you have a textbook. If they're home, send home the textbook. You know, if, if they don't have access to textbooks, then it has to be an article that's going to be posted online. And I think that the stability is that our goals for what students have to know and what they have to be able to do, they don't change. Our goal to create relationships with students and their families, that doesn't change. What changes is maybe the way that we connect with learners, and that still goes back to that PLC structure. What do you do when you're not hearing from kids, right? And that's when you get together with your colleagues and be like, there are three kids who are doing nothing. Problem solved together. It's the same thing you would do if everybody was in front of you. These three kids aren't making progress. And I think the newness makes us forget what we know and what we know how to do well. And grounding in like, what are the pieces of a lesson and what are our goals and how do we work together as colleagues and how do we reach out to families when we see that students are struggling? All that is exactly the same. We just might be doing more of that on the computer or through you know, phones or more traditional, untraditional methods. And, and again, this is not about being the best at technology. You give me Google Classroom and a couple of links and I can make magic. And what I think that people are getting buried in is trying to like keep up with the Joneses that teachers using this many tools on, you know, like stick with high quality instruction, create that instruction synchronously or asynchronously and make sure that students are on the other end. And I know this is so cheese ball, but I saw something the other day, like when we were growing up, our best teachers were virtual, like your Mr. Rogers, your Sesame Street, like we watch that crap all the time. Right. And it's like, how do we create instruction and say, this is not ideal, but like an international pandemic is not ideal and education can't solve all the world's problems. But what we can do is provide instruction in the goals and the methods that we know are beneficial for learners to grow up and learn more things on their own. And so what I say to my teachers is like, stop worrying about, if you can connect to students, that's a good enough tool right now. Okay, and, and all of the 20 million things that the district buys, which is great, that's less important right now than one-on-one -on -one connections with students and their families to share what our goals are, to provide instruction, to provide resources to learn more, and some mechanism for students to share with us how they're doing so we can react accordingly. So connection before content, content before format. I love it. I love it. I mean, yeah. oh, we should make a graphic. I love this. I love this. And it's, it's going back to exactly what we know as educators, right? Like, you know, your educational pedagogy, you know how to handle this. The content doesn't change the format might. I love this. I love this. Thank you so much. Um, so last question, parting question, and you may have, already, we might, I think it may kind of pull from this, but I'm going to give you one last chance if you want to add anything else to it is, um, you know, what is something in your playbook that we could steal from you and add to ours? Uh, you know, knowing that there's not really a playbook for a pandemic, but, um, you know, when we are working with our, our teachers, you know, in that professional learning opportunity as instructional coaches, as principals, what's something or a strategy or, or something that we can, can, uh, add to our toolbox of tricks these days? I think one of the simplest things that we can do is I'm big on like choice and voice, but I think the voice part is simply after one week of doing whatever you're doing, reach out to your students and reach out to your families and have them fill out this sentence stem. Moving forward in order to help me to learn more, it would be cool if dot, 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 right? And what I would say to my learners is I don't care if they're adult learners. I don't care if they're, you know, they're very, very young, but it's essentially like, think about what works for you well for learning in whatever place you're learning. And just say, what is something that I am not doing that you find might be beneficial and be like reasonable. Like it would be cool if we didn't do work. Well, that's a silly thing to say because you know that it's really important for you to learn. But like whenever I do this, I'm floored at how awesome the feedback is. So even as like a professional kind of development provider is I had an opportunity last week to do two days with the same group. 
the first day. Like it was super flexible. Same exact thing that I'm saying with you. I was very clear about this is what you'll be able to know. And this is what you'll be able to do at the end of the session. I provided some direct instruction, like on video. I gave a break of time to say, now explore more about this. If you want to listen to a podcast, if you want to watch a TED talk, if you want to like look at exemplars, and then you're going to share with me kind of what your aha moments are. Right. And then at the end, I said like, what could I do differently? And what was so fascinating is out of like 45 different responses, there were probably 20 that would be like, it would be really cool if you treated us like students and actually taught a lesson. It would be really cool if instead of like talking about how to design the lesson, you mod, right? And, and then somebody else said it would be really cool if we created groups to do the expression piece. So I was able to come back the next time and say, I was, I was reflecting on your ideas. This is what you said. This is how I'm designing differently as a result of your feedback. Please let me know if like I, I got it right. But I think that evolution as we learned that it was up to us to design things that worked for learners, as opposed to it's up to us to work with learners to decide how do we create the best outcomes for our community. And I think that when we say, what can I do differently? We open ourselves up to barbs like, don't talk so much. Whereas it would be cool if we had more time to work in groups. It would be cool if there were closed captions when you were presenting. And I'm like, oh, I can do something about that. So again, it would be cool if is your best friend, be open to feedback, be open to collaboration. And like, you can make magic over time. It's not fast, but like, we know the instruction, learners know themselves, put it together, magic. You heard it here, friends. Oh my Woo! God. I absolutely, uh, I hope you out, if you didn't know Katie Novak before, now you do, and now you see why we all absolutely adore you. You've given me so much to think about. I hope if you're out there, you've grabbed a ton for your playbook. And um, for all you coaches out there coaching through uncertainty, grab, grab some of these nuggets for sure. Thank you so much, Katie, for sharing um, your ideas and your knowledge with us. Keep up the amazing work following you what you're doing and we greatly appreciate you thanks so much guys thanks so much coaching through uncertainty is a future ready schools podcast series that explores the new shifts in teaching and learning that are happening right now future ready instructional leaders coaches and teachers are navigating challenges that were theoretical optional or barely feasible only last year but have now become full-blown full speed in the moment realities coaching through uncertainty is hosted by me brianna hodges national faculty for future ready schools in each episode we'll connect with future ready coaches on a mission to inspire engage and amplify innovative professional practice We'll hear from the nation's top instructional leaders as they share their experience, expertise, and advice to reimagine teaching and learning to better suit today's learners with tomorrow's tools. You can subscribe and listen to Coaching Through Uncertainty wherever you get your podcasts. Go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Coaching Through Uncertainty and Future Ready Schools are projects of the Alliance for Excellent Education. Together we're better. Together we're future ready.